Good morning. Welcome to our service on this 11th Sunday after Trinity. I open with the watchword from 1 Peter 5 verse 5. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Just a few announcements. As you know, the 7th of September, the first Saturday of September, we have our bazaar and we're very excited. Preparations have begun. We're still looking for people who are willing to help out for an hour or two on the day. And any donations are also still welcome. For more information, you can contact me or Christiana. We're very excited for the 7th of September, our coming bazaar. At the church, our normal projects such as the Bless a Baby continues. Also, our weekly Bible study meetings continue. So if you want to find out more, please let me know. It's always good to have more um, people join in with our Bible studies and contribute to the projects where we are busy with. Let us open this morning with prayer. Thank you, Lord, that we can hear your word wherever we are. Thank you, Lord, that we know that you are with us and you call us, Lord, your people, your children. Let your word be for us a blessing. Let it be for us a comfort. And thank you for what you have given us. Amen. Let us confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is Galatians 2, verse 15 to 21. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus, in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I die to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. There were two rugby clubs and that were close together. And due to financial difficulties, they were merged into one club. Although some had doubts about the process, with hard work of the two club captains, the merge went very well. In fact, they were doing much better than expected. It seemed as if the two team cultures did not clash, but complemented each other nicely. The captain of the one team, Tim, started playing touch rugby with the members from the other club. This was fun and freeing. Tim's original club was strict about playing touch rugby because they were worried players would get hurt and that would put the team at a disadvantage. John, the captain of the other team, was really happy about the new camaraderie, even friendships that developed. John had been the first captain to build relationship with the other team and was well received from the beginning, or so it seemed. After a few weeks, all the members from Tim's club started coming to the touch rugby sessions. Not to play, but to watch. They saw Tim playing recklessly or, as others might say, freely. All the non-playing members from that club also heard about these touch rugby sessions and needed to see for themselves if it was true. Their once firm leader was now running wildly with members from the other club. 
After this change in Tim's behavior was noticed by the older members, Tim realized that they knew and started withdrawing from the touch rugby games. He reverted to the strict regulations of his original team and this started to show in their matches. The teams didn't click as well as they had before. It was as if the players were following two different strategies, constantly missing each other's cues. John was not happy about this and addressed Tim directly. Can you understand John's anger in this story? John was furious about what Tim had done and felt the need to address it. There is anger in this story, just as there is anger in our text. Paul is furious about what was happening in the church. You cannot see it when you only read from verse 15. But in previous verses in chapter 2, we read about what's happening. The setting is the new church, where for some time the Gentiles had been welcomed, even to the point of sharing common meals with the Jewish Christians. Up to this time, there had been no division debate in Antioch over the practice of eating together, and the habit clearly ignored the usual categories of Jew and Gentile. Peter, on his journey, joined the Christian community and enjoyed table fellowship with certain members from James, Jews from the Jerusalem church who still adhere to Jewish laws and regulations. And they arrived, and either their presence or a message they brought caused Peter to cease attending the common meals. His withdrawal was obviously noticed, and prominent members such as Barnabas and other Jewish Christians were persuaded by his actions, and likewise stopped attending table fellowship with the Gentiles. Paul viewed this as a failure to be straightforward about the truth of the gospel, and so confronted Peter publicly. If you, a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew in attending the common meals, how can you now forsake these Gentiles, Christians, and compel them to become Jews in order to continue their association with you? Just like in the rugby story, where Tim's withdrawal caused a rift and damaged the team's unity, Peter's actions caused the division within the early church. Paul's confrontation with Peter was necessary to uphold the gospel's message about what saves, or rather who saves. Paul wanted to make it clear that a Christian does not need to uphold the laws of the old covenant to ensure salvation. Salvation comes through faith and justification by Christ Jesus alone. We till today do something similar to what Peter is doing. We might not notice it, but it happens. I'm not talking simply about mixing with others. We know that, and I'm happy to say that I see in our congregation that we do it well, that there's no problem with mixing with new members or members who come from different cultures or backgrounds. There's something else, something deeper. We, till today, bring Old Testament laws to set us apart from others, instead of holding on to the new covenant and to trust in God's judgment. What do I mean by this? There are two words that theologians use to describe this. The one is legalism, where one attempts to gain favor with God by observing the Torah, and the other is nominism, where one in response of faith in God, who acted on their behalf, lives a life that is governed by the Torah. The Old Covenant is to uphold the Torah and therefore be blessed and ensured of salvation. But this is not what the Gospel message is. The Gospel message is that we are saved by faith in Christ alone, and not by works. When we place our works in front of others as a way to distinguish ourselves from them, we are no longer living the Gospel message, but become half-Judaizers in practice and probably in theory as well. What examples can we think of in this regard? Tim's choice to stop playing touch rugby, Peter's choice to stop eating of the Gentiles, follow the old covenant teachings of creating divisions between us and them. Not simply stay away from non-Christians, but deeper, trying to cause a divide between the Christians that are good enough to our standards and those who are not. If I believe a Christian should live this way, then that's the how a Christian should live. If you are mixing with other Christians who live in a different way, clearly you are wrong because I am right. Do you often hear this type of thinking? 
saying, I am right and they are wrong? When a gospel tells you that your actions can place you above someone else or allow you to cast judgment on who is righteous and who not, I would not trust that gospel. This belief in actions flow from a belief in scriptural interpretation. The older members from Tim's club believe that touch rugby is dangerous and can lead to injuries which disadvantages the team. They believe this because that's what they were told in the past, and they held on to it. New insights and developments had shown how good touch rugby is in promoting flexibility and reducing injuries, but no, they won't listen. Like the Pharisees who believed their, only their strict interpretation of the Bible was correct, leaving no place for the bait, the older members from Tim's club held blindly to their doctrine. Remember, the Pharisees, when they used their strict and literal interpretation of Scripture, attacked Jesus. He time and again showed them that there is more depth than they thought. A gospel that doesn't allow for personal relationship with Jesus to guide one's reading and that doesn't promote discussion and different interpretations is a Pharisee gospel, one that is dead like the book they hold on to, denying the spirit to make the word alive for our time. Paul's words in the closing of our pericope or is a powerful reminder of the core of our faith. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I die to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Just as Tim's decision to stop playing touch rugby caused a division in the team, Peter's action caused a division in the early church. Both actions reflect an old covenant mindset, one that creates barriers and distinctions between those who are in and those who are not. But Paul's response to Peter and his message to the Galatians is clear. We are not called to rebuild the walls that Christ had torn down. Paul understood that going back to the Old Covenant with its laws and regulations was a way of setting some people apart from others. It was a way of saying, I am right and they are wrong. But in Christ, those distinctions are gone. The law was fulfilled in Jesus, and through his sacrifice we are all made one in him. When we, like Peter, start to rebuild what has been torn down, when we begin to rely on our works, our traditions, or our interpretation of the law to set ourselves apart from other Christians, we prove ourselves to be transgressors. We nullify the grace of God. If righteousness could be achieved through the law, then Christ died for nothing. But Paul reminds us that we have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Our lives are no longer about proving ourselves right or setting ourselves apart. Our lives are about living by faith in the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. So let us not fall into the trap of rebuilding what Christ had already torn down. Let us not impose old covenant laws and practices as barriers between us and our fellow believers. Instead, let us live out the new covenant, trusting in the grace of God and the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ alone. As we go forward, may we remember that our identity is not in the law, but in Christ. And may our lives reflect the unity, love and grace that He has given us. Amen. Let us share the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes His face shine upon you and is gracious to you. The Lord looks upon you with favor and gives you peace. Amen.